It's a joy to be here with all of you tonight, wherever you are listening in or whatever time, if you're listening to this as a recording at a later date. Greetings. It's good to be here with you. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping of my own in that uh, for those of you who would like the notes, I post them to my own website, which is toothlectures.com. It's there on the bottom right hand portion, the number two, letter TH lectures, no spaces. Doesn't need to be capitalized that way. It's just, it's easier for you to see. Uh, toothlectures.com. The notes are there as we speak. And let's press on, let's move forward. So, a little bit about me so you know who I am. I always like to know when I go to courses a little bit about who is the speaker, who am I listening to. How do they practice with their philosophy? So a little bit about me. I went to the University of Michigan for dental school. I'm currently an adjunct faculty there. Um, and it's just a great uh, privilege to be a part of that school. Uh, all dental schools right now, as we know, are going through some adjustments. And, uh, you know, the students are doing marvelous. And dental education will continue. Um, with some changes, but, uh, you know, think of your, your dental schools at this time as well, not just uh, what we're personally experiencing. The students are making adjustments just like we are in our day-to-day -day life. But I practice in Cleveland, Ohio, so if you understand sports rivalry, that means I'm a traitor to my home state of Ohio. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. I ended up there and back home after school because my father set up shop over 48 years ago now uh, is when he set up the Bisca Dental. And I joined him 14 years ago. And uh, to my dad's credit, he's still uh, practicing, still enjoying it, slowing down some more, thinking about uh, more of his future. Um, but it's great to have dad alongside. I test a lot of products, work with the dental advisor as a clinical consultant. And I love products because I think products really do make or break um, some procedures. And there's some really awesome stuff that's available and coming available soon. And we'll certainly touch on some of those things. I also have an adjunct at Creighton's Dental School. Um, I, I'm very proud to have an adjunct there as well, thanks to the Jesuits and some good friends there. Um, I also have uh, some other uh, affiliations that I'm proud of. I'm, of course, a member of Catapult Education, which is bringing this webinar to you this evening and have been for several years now. And it's such a great group, really a think tank and some very diverse leaders in the dental community with different schools of thinking. And, and that's what I love about it. It's not cookie cutter. And one of the things that I bring that's sort of unique is I, I love people and personalities and I have some certifications and leadership and adding value and being able to better understand our patients. Because what I learned after being at this now for 14 years chairside in private practice is that the dentistry eventually kind of evens out. But what continues to be a day-to-day -day challenge is our management of the personalities that come in. So I am passionate about teaching a little bit about that. And I have 24 years of experience in dental. Uh, my father had the foresight when I started showing interest. He got me involved. I worked as a dental lab technician. I worked chair side as a dental assistant in college to make some money and, and just see if, I, if dentistry was the right fit. And then eventually became the dentist. So I, I have made a career of this. I, I still have many more years ahead of me. But uh, dentistry has been good. And I still believe that the best is yet to come. So my disclaimer, uh, special thanks to GC America. We have some great partnerships that we work with at Catapult. And it's relationships. That's really what it comes down to is that we work with these companies and they come to us sometimes before products are even available to the general public. And they allow us to give feedback and whatnot, and it's just such a great partnership, and I'm thankful tonight that they uh, put forth uh, me in this program, and uh, I'm grateful for it to be here with you tonight, sharing some good ideas. 
it's amazing you hear the cliches, right? What a difference a day makes. I'm certain that you, if you're like me, you've heard that one before. And I can tell you from my lectures pre-COVID, uh, most of the concerns and the metrics bore out the densest concerns overwhelmingly were about insurance reimbursement and the declining checks that we're receiving in return. Some, a strong portion of our colleagues were concerned about the impact of corporate dentistry, that competition was getting tougher and whatnot. But certainly since mid-March, things have been very different. And we now have different concerns on our plate. And I know my practice, was shut down for 12 weeks. And we took it very seriously here in Ohio. We were pretty early into the stay at home, stay safe, and dentists were considered non-essential and we um, closed shop, we didn't resist. And once the curve flattened, we opened up practice three weeks ago. So June 1st was my return to work date. And I can tell you that, uh, not much has changed. I was concerned about how it was going to be, mostly from the the consumer side of it. Were patients going to be fearful and how are they going to respond with this new information? And here's some good news. Um, we may wear more clothing these days. And this is a picture of me donning my new getup, right? I, I'm wearing a surgical cap. I've got Really interesting, neat product, a virostatic shield, um, soon to come available in the United States. Um, it's got a protein coating that catches 96% of viruses, sticks to it, deactivates them, doesn't transfer it off to your hands, and allows it to do a head wrap. You can double layer it. Um, and of course, wearing uh, your N95 or level three mask over it, face shield. Really love this from Dental Safety Solutions. I looked for weeks amidst all the backlog and back orders all through April for a face shield that would fit around my loop. And I could not find anything that felt comfortable. I know there's a lot of options, but I saw this up shield. And what I liked is that it doesn't sit on your head, which in my opinion, doing dentistry in these new conditions where you're not taking stuff off as frequently and uh, giving yourself a rest, you need to get more weight off your head. And this up shield's great, sits on your sternum, takes all the pressure off your neck and no glare. I can really see through. So the folks over at Dental Safety Solutions, it's just a great little find. I think it's $100, you order it, it's a direct order neat little thing. But as I mentioned, patients are coming back and there is a pent up demand and people are being very careful, very respectful, and it's a pleasant surprise to return back to work. And I hope many of you have shared that experience. And if you aren't back to work on a regular basis, uh, I want to share that good news with all of you. But the best is yet to come. So here's some objectives in what I want to say tonight. And, and I want to understand if, if I could set a picture of what this is like in my mind, it's, it's a fireside chat with some colleagues. I'm really here to share some of the ideas and things that I'm doing currently. Some of this stuff I, I had already been doing, and it's so apropos that in the current climate, it just makes sense. So I, I just want to share some thoughts and ideas, and my objectives are to share my experiences with my colleagues having a good evening chat. It'll go quicker than you think. I wanna be authentic, very real, transparent with you. I wanna add value if I can. That's really what I'm about tonight is giving you something that you can walk away with and go, that was valuable, or man, I learned something that I'm gonna try out or that, that I think might work with the way that I like to do practice. And of course, have fun. Uh, my personality type, I, I like to enjoy myself. Uh, life's too short to take it seriously. And the truth is you never get out alive anyway. So let's have a little bit of fun while we go along tonight, shall we? Now, the hot topic, if you've been on any of the OSHA updates, guidelines, any of the stuff that you're following or tracking, if you're as well-read as 
I've tried to be through the course of this ongoing pandemic. Aerosolization is the big concern with this virus, at least from what we, we have been told that they haven't changed their story on, and I'll leave it at that, is that we know that it's in the droplets. So if you're close in speech, somebody who is a spitter while they're talking, um, just being uh, in our environment, particularly what we do day in and day out, uh, the droplets are what contain the virus. And so if we can do anything to mitigate our exposure to these aerosols and whatever we can't mitigate, we then use PPE to protect. Um, that's the ticket. And that's, that's why we are probably one of the best prepared industries. I read in Business Insider Weekly article that said uh, they rated risk reward of returning to a business in this post COVID era where this it's now the virus, everybody knows it's out there, businesses are coming back online. I should really say post shutdown rather than post COVID because COVID's still here. Um, that the greatest risk reward business or one of the top ones was dentists. As they said, they're very safe. They, they have been practicing universal precautions and extra things for a long, long time. So we're well prepared, but I know some of our colleagues they're concerned. And listen, I know people, close friends who have lost family members. This is very real. Uh, this virus is out there. And for whatever reason, there are certain individuals it is just savage towards. And I know, I know some people, you no know, close friend who lost two family members. And so it's very real. So people might be looking for alternatives to creating aerosols, maybe as they gear up. And let me just throw out there, there's never been a better time to get involved in doing sleep dentistry. And I got involved about a year ago um, with a company called Healthy Start, and they actually treat kids. They have a system where they start, they believe everything starts from their research um, with sleep breathing disorders that occur as a result of mouth breathing children. And this really hit home and resonated with Tim Bisga because I was a classic mouth breather. I had terrible allergies as a kid. I remember this time of year as a child, like not being able to go outside without taking my allergy medication, one that's long been pulled off the market due to um, some side effects. It was called Hismanol. Uh, some of those who are a bit older may remember that name. Um, and, and that was the only way I could go outside. And I was a classic mouth breather, high pull headgear, ortho. Um, I was a class one, div one, a class two, div one, ortho. So I had that over jet. And uh, this really intrigues me to think that so much of malocclusion can be linked to mouth breathing children, among a list of other things, such as wetting the bed, ADHD, learning issues in school, a um, lot of good research and data that's out there. Um, but to drive it home, what they have found, Healthy Start in their system is that sleep breathing disorders, 90% of kids exhibit one of the symptoms. And that 60% of kids have four or more, and 20% of kids are going to experience some form of bedwetting as a result of mouth breathing and restless sleep that's caused by it. And that when you look at the age population in these growing kids, ages four to 12, so pre puberty, 92% of the symptoms don't self resolve. And so, just briefly, it is a mouth guard system that's prefabricated helps your, your children that you see, classic kids that come in with those allergic shiners. Maybe they have a pacifier that mom has been reluctant to take away too long because it's the only thing that seems to help the kid go to sleep, yet they're five, six years old. You know, it's well past its time. These are the ones you can begin to introduce. They have a wonderful education platform. I am just a user of the product. 
and I have my kids. This is a picture of my six-year-old daughter. And I snapped this uh, while she was sleeping with her, um, her little habit corrector in there. And what it does is it's promoting nasal breathing and the chewing and the swallowing that they may do on the appliance during the night causes normal expansion of the palate and tongue to be in the proper position and less likelihood for crowded teeth um, for the child and potentially a reduction in orthodontic treatment or complete elimination. So that's something to consider in these, you know, post uh, shutdown COVID era, if you're looking to minimize aerosol sleep medicine. And really I think the fork in the road is deciding, do you wanna treat children? that are growing and you're really helping with these appliances to manipulate a growth curve? Or are you looking to treat adults, which is a completely different style and modality. And there are certainly great lecturers with far more knowledge than me as a part of Catapult that can educate you on those things. So when I left dental school in 2006, I really had this pie in the sky belief that this is what life was gonna be like that my patients were all going to be smiling, loving coming in, and life was gonna be great. And what I have found throughout the years isn't that dentistry is bad, but that my role is less like this happy dentist and more like MacGyver. And I'm a child of the 80s, and MacGyver was a great sitcom that was on in the prime time hour. And MacGyver seemed to be able to do just about anything with paper clip or bubble gum or whatever he had lying around to be able to diffuse the situation. Uh, I, I suppose he is the forerunner to the Jack Bauer 24 series, right? Because that's sort of the dilemma MacGyver was always trying to diffuse the situation. And I found after being away from dentistry for 12 weeks and now returning for the past three, do you know one of the biggest stressors that I found that is returned or what I've discovered about dentistry that's stressful is that even though you schedule patients for a procedure, you never really know how it's gonna go till you kind of get into it. And sometimes just the way the day's going that day or other things, uh, that is kind of what's still there uh, to a degree. But what's wonderful is that our pace is slowed. And now some of those stresses are mitigated as opposed to where we were just three months ago, where it was as quickly and as efficiently as we can get people moving. And now it's a much more comfortable pace, but it still hasn't changed. We're still doing, you know, MacGyver-like things in my opinion. And this is a, a classic case and it demonstrates sort of a few items that are sort of relevant to the, the climate that we're currently in with COVID-19. This young lady came to me a couple of years ago now with a chief complaint that her bonding just kind of falls out. And when you do a close examination, you can see very closely on nine mesial an edge line, a sort of a, a little piece of the diastema closure that was done. You can also see there's caked plaque pretty heavily on those teeth. Not an ideal situation for bonding, but what this young lady would do is these had actually fallen out. What she would do, she'd remove the composite diastema piece for lunch, eat her food so she didn't lose the piece, and then she'd sort of put it back in, and then she'd let her teeth get a little furry so that it would sort of hold in better during the day. I know that sounds sort of gross, but that was the best as she described it of what was going on. But of course, when she presented, my chief concern was bloody gums, and plaque, because bonding with those conditions, oh, that would be such a stressful day in normal times, right? So what I did is something that I've been doing for a long, long time, and, and that is, is I, I told her, look, in this condition, not ideal, but if you can whip your gums into shape, I'm gonna give you a mouth rinse, it's gonna be very, very helpful, and it's gonna make a big difference. And my go-to product I've been using for over five years is this product called Oracure. It's a two-part activated mouth rinse that's chlorine dioxide. That's the active ingredient. 
And what's interesting is that I had known it is very potent antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial. It's one of the most effective agents. Chlorine dioxide is that neutralizing volatile sulfur compounds that cause halitosis, bad breath. And I've been using pre-rinsing for a long, long time because of that research from Gordon Christensen about aerosols and the Petri dishes and how pre-rinsing really cuts down on the growth of bacteria in the Petri dishes in this experiment. And I've been doing pre-rinsing for over a decade, solid. And I've been using this for five years since I stumbled on it. And here there's documented research back from Japan in 2010 when SARS broke out, uh, a very close relative of the coronavirus. And they did studies on chlorine dioxide's effectiveness at killing this particular type of virus. And fortunate for us, this is one of the easier viruses to eliminate. 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol, though it is very difficult to find these days, is extremely effective at eliminating coronavirus. And chlorine dioxide is no different. It's extremely potent at uh, an effective agent at being antiviral. So I put her on the rinse and one of the benefits is it dissolves the, the salivary pellicle. The same thing we remove when we do propy paste, right? That's what gives that squeaky clean feeling for our patients post prophylaxis. And two weeks, Sent her just with the rinse, told her to do a better job brushing, but to make sure she did these twice a day. And another rinse, just in the same family, you may have been hearing some, some things that I'm doing now in the COVID-19 era, is I have my patients pre-rinse with chlorine dioxide for, you know, as close to 60 seconds as I can get them to hold it in. And then we spritz their mouth and throat with hypochlorous acid. Uh, this is a preparation that's done at 200 parts per million. You can buy it for your office. You can have your patients go direct to the website um, where I purchased mine. And hypochlorous acid is getting a lot of uh, press these days because it naturally occurs in the body and it is extremely effective at killing viruses, bacteria, Etc. Um, and one company that is making a headway in sort of marketing this to dentists, and I, I found this actually a buddy of mine. Funny how people reach out to you at different times. I haven't talked to this fella in 20 years since I graduated high school, but he has visited our office. I just haven't been there. He works for a medical sales company. And when COVID 19 broke out, he remembered I was a dentist. He saw this come up. And it is tablets that you drop and can make fresh hypochlorous acid to use in your office. And mainly I'm using hypochlorous acid to spray the floors, counters, anything non-porous, but I keep it away from electronics because it's very oxidative. And so it's got a lot of free chlorine, a very, very small, small percentage of hypochlorite, but nothing that would bleach out your clothes. And it actually just leaves a feeling in the room like you are at a Holiday Inn Express that has a pool. That same sort of chlorinated smell sort of fills the air. It's very refreshing, very clean scented, um, but light. It's not too heavy. So those are some alternatives and things. Now back to this rinse, this chlorine dioxide. This young lady was on it for two weeks. The results are always the same. People come back just from simply applying this wonderful rinse and look at the difference. There's minimal plaque, minimal inflammation. Now I can go ahead and I can do a successful bond on this with some predictability. Now, my next challenge is I got to get all the old bonding off. And one of the things that I've learned is that that's a lot easier said than done. Of course, it does help if you turn the water spray off and if you go slow and you do a dry cut, you can sort of see the composite. But I found it's much, much easier if you buy on Amazon, which has become my best friend during the stay at home orders. And even now, I mean, but I've really picked it up 
um, with not really wanting to go into stores or just having long lines and the, the hassle of it. Amazon, I order almost everything, it feels like. This is a great little item. This is a screenshot of it. It's an LED black light pen. And what it does, and its only purpose in dentistry is to help you be able to see and differentiate tooth from composite resin. So it reflects off, the black light picks up some of the barium glass there in it, and you're able to see, and this is, if you're doing buttons for Invisalign or any sort of orthodontic system with tray aligners, it's really a, a nice way to know you've thoroughly removed it. You just shine this light into the patient's mouth, and much like that photograph depicts there, you can just see it. And I, I think if you can see it, you can treat it, and that makes a big difference. So we've safely removed. We know that all of the old material is off and now it's just running through your process. We're not really diving into like my process or bonding agent per se and giving you a talk about megapascals and whatnot, but I'm a total etch bonder. I like to use the blue shampoo. Uh, I think it's tried and true. It's got predictability, you can't go wrong. Universal bonding agents have become so forgiving. Um, it really makes a big difference. In this case, I made a small jig, and that gives me a lingual surface. I did this pre for coming in because I knew I had two weeks to sort of do a small little wax up. And you know what makes this really great now? Pre-COVID, a lot of my lectures were around efficiency. You talk about how do we do things better, safer, faster, more efficient. And now we're talking differently, right? We're talking, how do we do things safe? How do we do things still with efficiency, but with a different mindset? And that can we maximize and get as much done and can we mitigate the risk? If you look in the background of this photo, you're gonna see a bite block, tongue retractor, cheek retractor, that's dry shield. I use dry shield, some people like isolite uh, or iso dry. I've been using dry shield, wonderful because it was efficient. It's a great way to free up both of your assistant's hands and be more efficient in the procedure. But now it has the added benefit of it's helping with the aerosolization and keeping it down. And so it's helping keep less in the room and helping keep you and your team safer. So in this case, I'm using Teflon tape. It's one of my favorite tools for diastema closures. It takes a little practice, but it's really not that hard. You know, a little, little trial and error, but I fold it over. I build the composite to touching right up against it. Then I fold it the opposite direction. And then what I'm left with is a small piece wedged between a nice tight contact. I merely floss that out and it comes out quite nicely. Sometimes you have to take a little lightning strip, but uh, even a serrated saw works wonderfully well. I then go to work on the laterals, do a little bit there. We get them to a shape of about 90%. This is about where I, I take them. And then I want to add a little bit of enhancement, but I like to do it in an efficient manner. And I was taught this trick by my good friend, Susan McMahon. And what she does and what she taught me from a course she took is you take a coarse grit diamond that's kind of one of that's near its end life. You're probably not going to use it to cut a crown prep, but still has some good diamonds on it for something like this. And what you do is you put it into your handpiece. I have the benefit of electric handpiece, so I can turn the, the speed way down. And you're just going over and you're sort of intentionally scratching the surface. And the purpose of doing this is remember that when you took your dental anatomy, teeth have texture, right? And you can build that in intrinsically, but it's a challenge to do it. And I found one of the easiest ways to do it is this technique. You go ahead and you scratch it, and then you take your polishers. I like to use Enhance for this. And the reason is, is Enhance, if you feather it, the harder you push on it, the more it cuts. It'll cut anatomy into your composite without damaging the tooth. And the lighter your touch, the more of a shine and a, a gloss that it gives. And then I run some polished paste, et cetera, and look at the texture it gives you. And, and it, I just like it when you see texture in teeth. 
um, that doesn't look unnatural. This looks very natural, very normal, gives that little bit of light reflection that just makes it look not like filling material or composite, but it looks like teeth. And, and that's sort of the goal overall. Products that I used in this to accomplish it, I use the TPH effects, which is they have dense ply thrown. It has two dentin opaque colors that I really like, an A1 opaque called D1 and a D3, which is an A3 opaque equivalent. And I use that to block some of the light, use it on the lingual surface. And then I'm a big fan of this category, injectable composite. Love the term because it really does describe the rheology perfectly because it's not a flowable and it's not really a filled composite. Whether you like smooth and creamy or you like firm and packable type composites, you get the idea. It's more of something that you work with an instrument versus something that you flow like water. This is an in-between. And when you push firm, it'll flow out and yet, if you go slow, you can stack this and do layers and it's beautiful. What I use it to do is I will build about a third to two thirds of the tooth in the dentin opaque color. And then the final like liquid veneer layer is this injectable composite, this geoneal universal injectable. And they come in a variety of shades. And I seem to stay in the A1, A2, or a B1 shade for most of what I'm doing when it comes to the social six. And it creates a great smooth surface. It looks like a direct veneer. It's close to it with any material. And I just do that as the final layer. And it's a wonderful little material that you can use universally. And what I love about it is they have enough filler. These are highly filled, even though the rheology is such that it can be flowable-like and stackable-like in the same syringe. I know that sounds like not possible, but it totally is. Uh, they've also managed to put enough filler that it's strong, that you can use this in class one, class two, class threes, and so on and so on. So it's truly a universal material. And being that my lab background is such, I always enjoy things that flow like a wax, like a warm wax. And this is very analogous to me of working with a warm wax that you can really sculpt and, and shape and get it to polish and just look beautiful. Another good point to mention in this conversation, and I've been doing this for a while, but I think it bears you know, mentioning is the use of single use burrs and polishers. So I use a, a variety. Every office has their favorites. I use enhanced minis because when they switch to the mini size, they really reduce the waste or the feeling like waste that you would get when you throw away those larger cup ones. And they never really, they're not meant to be re-sterilized, but these are much more in line with their uh, DFUs, which is single use and they're smaller. They work great. I use microcopy burrs a lot, particularly their single use aesthetic finishing carbide series. Uh, it's great, I like a sharp cutting carbide and really after doing one or two, three surfaces of teeth, you really gotta pitch the burr um, because those are really designed for fine finishing, gives you that nice, you know, wet uh, glaze sort of look. And I'm a big fan of the Super Snap Singles from Shofu. What a great little product. They're individual, the four step in the series of their discs, the four grits in both the small size and the regular standard cup. What I've always liked about Shofu disc is that no metal mandrel in the middle. So when I worked with, I, I think 3M makes great products, but their, their soft flex system, it always would seem I get near the end of polishing with it and I would nick and put a little metal mark on the composite. Perhaps it's just me being careless and that's a fair uh, assessment, but I like the fact that it's goof proof, that it's a full surface of polishing. You don't have to worry about nicking or putting any of those marks on, especially later on or towards the end of an appointment, you might be running over. 
So just a little bit into the technique, I just want to show this briefly. These pictures just lay it out a little simpler uh, of how I do a, a class four and add that texture in it. So again, simple class four. I did a wax up in advance uh, real quick for this patient, made a lingual jig. It just saves you time, right? A stitch in time saves nine, as they say. This is a great little way to just save from having to freehand it as much, but you can totally do it. I go ahead and I stretch over the surface of uh, the adjacent tooth there, uh, some Teflon tape. I put a healthy bevel. I'm a believer in putting a bigger bevel, the better. You're gonna blend the material in, make it disappear. You're bringing more enamel rods in. You're getting better longevity of your bond. And total etch technique here, bonding agent applied and cured. And then again, I'm gonna do the lingual surface with this A1, and or in this case, this is an A3 opaque, or D3 is the nomenclature that's used. And I press it up from the lingual, and then I go ahead and I, I do my shaping, a little bit uh, more of the composite, and then I put a final layer, sort of that liquid veneer as I described over the top, with a, the GC uh, injectable, the Geoneal in Universal Injectable, then shape it most of the way, and then go ahead with a coarse diamond, scratch that surface just ever so slightly. I'm not trying to mar it. I'm trying to just do it so that I can buff and polish it out with an enhance and create this effect. So I can't, I don't have the, the skills, or I should say the patience, to be able to hand layer that in and create those undulations quite like that. But I found that this works very well in my hands. And for those who are looking to take your class fours just up a notch, have a little bit of fun while you're doing dentistry these days with those type of cases, this is a great way to add that texturization that you see in magazines and you can do it just with using some materials you probably already have at the office. And then it gives you that nice shine when the teeth rehydrate in 24 hours, it'll be a perfect color match. But for an immediate post-op, looks really good. But these are my favorite cases to be able to, to help people along. And it kind of shows all the tools that we have available. This young lady came to my office because she wanted better appearance of her teeth, probed into it, came to find out that the reason that she left so much fuzz on the teeth and that white line up along the gum line around every tooth is plaque is because the white materia alba actually improved in her opinion the appearance of her teeth which was kind of sad and so we made a deal and the deal was is we were only going to do two teeth at a time and we set a budget because she had fixed budget and that's really one of the reasons I wanted to show this case at this particular juncture in the lectures, because you know many of our patients are the people that are running businesses that are hurting post shutdown. And many of our patients are financially in straits and they may wanna do dentistry, but you might have to find a creative way to be able to get them by for a couple years so they can either get back to work, get their business back to full capacity, whatever the challenges that they're facing. And so we had to do this on a budget. Yes, it would be great to have done, you know, full coverage crowns and all that, but we had to do this on a, on a budget. And so two teeth at a time, we did, this is all composite material. We carefully did the K removal. We cleaned everything up and really sitting, she'd come and sit for an hour or so. We'd do a couple teeth at a time and we just worked our way around the arch. That way I could build motivation. Each time she's coming in, I've been having her rinse at, throughout the process with chlorine dioxide. She has a bottle set that she took home. And we accomplished this through a combination, again, of using the TPH effects, two dentin shades, D1 and D3. In this case, this is a D1. The universal injectable, Geoneal from GC America, that is our liquid veneer. 
And then on some of the uh, posteriors where I was seeing mo more of the plaque along the gum line, I used Gyomer. This is a Shofu Beautiful Fill uh, flowable material. It has little bits of pre-centered glass ionomer into the resin matrix. And what I've seen in using this um, for several years now, I want to say it's been seven years I've used this product in seeing recalls. Whenever I use this up on the gum line, I see less brown staining. I see less demineralization. And it seems to create a zone, an area around that that sort of resists plaque. And so I kind of tailored that just around the gum line in those areas, kind of did a hybrid and we finished her around the arch. And we were able to take somebody who started off like this and we were able to slowly convert her using just composite material on a budget and not spending a ridiculous amount of time, just removing decay and making the teeth look a little bit better. And we did this, did this freehand and so this is some of the great materials that you have available, some things that you can do and, and really serve your patients well. So here's some other things that I've learned, some more MacGyver moves that might come in handy as you are going and ramping things back up in your, your practice. And this is a classic example. I mean, this is not a new story, but you might hear it more often now than maybe you did a few months ago. This guy came in, he had been a long time patient. He's a friend of my dad's, good guy. We've golfed together. He had resorption on tooth number nine, on the lingual, five years ago. And we treated it endodontically. We did MTA, we did all the stuff to sort of get that to heal up and it responded great. And he was doing wonderful, called up, he had a issue, tooth was hurting. Come to admit when we get into the questioning, he bit down on a rib bone. He went out to eat when restaurants were still open and he ordered some ribs and he bit down and he caught the bone just right. And he heard a click and he felt a shooting pain up into his nose and he called the office and I, I said, oh boy, uh, bad news, tooth fractured. I could bury a probe and you can see here, I took this photo, not only for your benefit, but for the patient. He uh, wanted to see what I was seeing, and I showed him this. Burying the probe, single isolated probing depth, is a classic indicator for crack tooth syndrome. Told him, tooth's got to go. We got to pull it. He was reluctant. Why? He doesn't want to lose the tooth, but he said, I don't have the money to do an implant. He said, so just pull it, and I'll go without it. Now, I, I kind of have a rule. I, I If it's somebody's front tooth, and it's gotta go, I'm kinda not gonna let them leave my office without a replacement option. Uh, and the reason being is, is that if they were to ever go to the grocery store and run into their friend, and their friend says who your dentist is, I would hate it if it were my name. And maybe that's me being vain, but man, when it's your front tooth, uh, I just feel like you gotta do something. And I said to them, I'm like, well, let me see what I can do to help you out. And I've read about some of these things. And so I, I had made a decision about what I thought I wanted to do. And so I went and proceeded with the extraction, but it came out very nicely. The clinical crown had fractured subgingively, subcrestally. So we carefully removed the root with peritones. So we didn't want to break any of the bone. I placed my own implant. So I'm thinking, even if he doesn't want this implant, I better make sure the site's as good as possible so that when he t changes his mind, things will be good to go. And so we went ahead and put a little bit, uh, clean the socket. I took the crown piece, etch and bonded it, put some GNL Universal Injectable, nice flowable, polished this up brilliantly. And then I bonded a little Orthotech wire on. And I made myself a little tooth ponic. And being that it is his own tooth, I made the assumption this is going to go in there very nice. It's going to fit in there. I did a little dry fit and his soft tissue should attach to the tooth and hold the gingival architecture for a future implant. So this is what I want you to be thinking. If you got somebody who might want an implant, but funds are tight, 
maybe you're able to use their clinical crown and bond something in. So again, in the background there picture, you can see the dry shield on the roof of uh, the patient's mouth there. We went ahead, put a little hemostatic gauze down in there that will dissolve to keep the bleeding from interfering with our bond. And we went ahead and bonded this in there, bonded the wings and polished it up. Looks good, solid as a rock. This is how I did it several years ago. And I gotta tell you, the beauty of private practice is you get to watch your work age. And getting to watch your work age means you get to see what works and what doesn't work. Now, I wanna prove to you this double wing that I did one week post-op, look at the healing, it's looking good, soft tissue looks excellent, but he's not doing a good job cleaning. He's getting some chromogenic bacteria um, around there because he's just really not cleaning it. And we went ahead, I gave him, read him the riot act, I'm kidding. I just said, hey, don't be afraid. He was afraid to actually brush it because he thought it would fall out. So I probably didn't do as good of a job emphasizing that it was as good as it was gonna be and hopefully it wasn't gonna fall out. Um, but just to show you this works, here's a two year follow-up. Two years, he comes in regularly for cleaning. That tooth is still hanging in there. We've done a decent job of maintaining most of the soft tissue. I have lost some of it, um, but we've made good of a bad situation being that the patient had tight funds and he was super happy with it. Now, I wanna show you that, you know, there are other ways to do it. And this is part of learning and kind of figuring things out. And I, I saw during the, the shutdown when I was at stay at home to stay safe, I found this word as I was doing some reading, this word that comes out of uh, French, uh, Southern Louisiana, this Cajun culture called Anyap. And it's this idea of something extra, it's unexpected, it's a gift, it's a bonus, it's something that's special. And I wanna give you a lanyap, and that is, is I wanna give you a peek of some of the excitement that I get in some of the roles and hats that I get to wear. And one of them is I get to try products before they ever come to market, or some before they're available here, but maybe they're cleared for here, but they're not commercially available, and yet they're overseas, et cetera. And so a while back, I had an opportunity. I got to go to Alsip, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago, GC's headquarters. And they had a brilliant dentist who had a terrible flight from New Zealand. But this guy, his luggage was lost. He was delayed. He flew like 32 hours. But he stood brilliantly before us in a uh, pair of shorts, flip-flops, and a button-up flannel and a t-shirt that he had. And he presented his research on how he's been using a product that was available to him, uh, made available by GC America, and he was using for large fillings, craft teeth, some interesting things. And this product is going to be coming available in October of this year, GC is, Finally, finally, I'm so excited making this available to American dentists. And I wanna show you sort of how I treat cases that have pontics now, whether it's a implant temporization or a case like that previous one where they don't have the funds, but we need something in the interim. He had a flipper, this young man comes in, he works with my brother-in-law and he has this flipper, he says it's awful looking, and it doesn't fit because he just lost his second implant. He's had it done, he's had it grafted, he's been to all the specialists, all the great names in Cleveland he's been to. And he's had two implant failures. And you know, one of the things I've learned in my 14 year career is in private practice is uh, a healthy dose of humble pie. And to know that sometimes if some of your colleagues have made attempts and passes at doing it. You might not have any better success than they have. So I'm listening to him and he said he's tired of bouncing between multiple offices and visits and it's failed twice. And he wants to know, is this a good option for a third? And what is his possible interim? What can he do? Cause the slipper is awful. Here's the implant that fell out. 
He brought it in hand. It actually came out that morning. And there's the old flipper that he hasn't had in his mouth for five years. So what do you think the chances of it fitting are? Slim to none. So I'm thinking, do we need to do a new one? Are, are there other options? So here's the clinical cases it presents. And I just ask you, would you attempt a third? And I wasn't going to do it for certain. I wasn't going to decide for the patient either, but I had an opinion. That's what he was here for. And I said, listen, we need to get you a tooth to stabilize the site. And then you can think about it when you have a clear head. That was my advice. When you have this crisis resolved, think about it with a clear head. So what we did is here's the change I've made. Research has shown, and I've seen it bear out in my own hands, that single wing bonded Maryland bridges, given the right occlusal situation, perform better than double wing bonded Maryland bridges. Now, the previous case I showed you, I made a double wing Ponic, a Maryland type bridge, bonded it in, still serving at two years well. But here's the adjustment I've made because I've had this material. This material is Everex, Everex Flow, which is from GC America. It is a composite resin that has shredded glass quartz fibers in the matrix. So it creates this rebarb-like effect. And when I, I don't use that term loosely. I mean, this literally gives structure and support and extra oomph to whatever restoration. The trick is, and the key is, is that it needs to be covered. If you're not using it as a core under a crown or you're using it as a base, then you're using it incorrectly. It's not a final layering material. This is for when you need extra strength that standard composite can't give you. And this allows you to build a sub subframe, a direct subframe using reinforced composite resin. And it will become available this October, I'm told, um, hopefully sooner, maybe September, uh, as Everex Flow comes in two shades, comes in like a universal and then a Denton color. So something that's a little bit more clear and see-through like this. And if you want something that's more like Denton opaque, uh, you've got that option as well. So this sets the subframe. This is a single wing. And now I'm going to go ahead and I got a little fancy. I use some pink Gradia uh, composite, which is great if you're looking for doing gum tinting with direct composite. Again, another GC product. And I built this tooth out of nothing around this Everex flow and end up shaping it. The final layer I put on, again, that liquid veneer is that genial universal injectable that I just love using for my final layer in these anterior direct applications. I did a little bit of shaping. I've got it 90%. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add my texturization. And this is the final shot. And pictures really do kind of, I can be critical and I pick this apart and say, I wish I had added a little more to the distal um, line angle to make it a little more bulbous. But he left there ecstatic, right? And he was thrilled because he didn't have to take something in and out. Color was pretty good match. He has time to think about it. And these are some of the things that I think are very relevant and very useful for your patients, especially in this particular time. Here is a classic way to utilize Everex Flow. This tooth needs a crown. It came in with a crack and I started the preparation and left this to demonstrate so that you could see along the distal lingual cusp extending to the distal marginal ridge is that fracture line. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds here, but if you read, you, know, you try to prep as much of the crack as you can, when you can, but sometimes you got to know when to say when, and you got to cut anchor. And in this case, I wanted to try to hold that crack from moving. And this is a great application of this material. You do your etch, you do your bonding agent, and then 
you go ahead and you apply this material right over the crack. It flows wonderful, looks and flows just like, um, like one of the best core paste you've ever handled in your life. It goes where you want it. You can sort of pat it and tap it. It's workable, it's malleable, it's not sticky. It has to do something with those uh, shredded uh, quartz fiber uh, shreddings in there, it must, but the handling on it's exceptional. And then you can go ahead and prep this now for your final crown. So I finished up the prep and now I've got that core. And I, I believe from what I saw presented years ago from the research, um, from that dentist from New Zealand and all the different data and all the anecdotal stuff. I've been placing this stuff for a long while. I've had it and uh, been using it. And I can tell you, I have seen that this helps prevent cracks from propagating further. I've seen more teeth rescued as a result that otherwise I would have might have deemed hopeless. It's a really great material and I'm super excited that it's gonna come available. So my final thoughts before I open it up, you know, for questions. All things flow and nothing abides. You cannot step into the same river twice for the waters are continually flowing on. Nothing is permanent except change. And I leave with the philosophical for this evening to say that we're in a season and certain things have changed. We wear a little bit more clothing. We go at a little bit slower pace and we take our time, but you'll find if you're like me, you get back into it. We're well prepared as an industry and we still have lots to be excited about. There's new great products coming out. Patients are excited. People still want to get dentistry. People are paying their bills, they're scheduling for appointments. I am living proof. And I wanted to end the webinar by saying, there is some good news out there and the best in dentistry is really yet to come. And if you wanted to reach me beyond tonight, this is how you can find me. I do have a Facebook page. Um, I have toothlectures.com. That's where all these notes are gonna be. You can personally email me at toothlectures at gmail.com. And then you can also, if you wanted a personality assessment of yourself, you could also go online. And from my private webpage, you could purchase one of those securely from the safety and security of your own home. So we are going to take a few questions. Can you please repeat the brand of the face shield that I'm using. You bet I can. I had it actually saved on my phone. I assumed that I would be getting this question. It is from, the company is called Dental Safety Solutions. And that is where you go to their website. And I believe the product is, is I can't remember exactly what the name of it's called, um, but they only sell a couple face shields and it's pretty clear, but it's dentalsafetysolutions.com. That is where you're going to be able to find that up shield that sits on your sternum. So that's a good question. Um, another question was, do I use chlorhexidine gluconate rinses? And I'll, the answer is I used to use it a ton. And it is antiviral, it's antibacterial, it's got great substantivity, super positively charged, cationic. The, the negatives, briefly, and I'll just touch on those, brown stain of the teeth, long-term, hated that. Taste alteration after use for longer than seven to 10 days. Patients really do start to taste metallic. And the third, which is more controversial. There's pretty good research and white, white papers out there that chlorhexidine in fresh extraction sockets, when rinsed in there, causes fibroblasts to be delayed. Fibroblasts are the collagen wound healing cells that we want to help our implants to integrate, our soft tissue and everything 
to come together. And there's some evidence out there and some believers that chlorhexidine can inhibit fibroblast formation, which delays wound healing, which isn't good. And just to put the cherry on top, there's been an alarming incident rate of chlorhexidine allergies. My good friend, Dr. Jason Goodchild, wrote a paper recently about uh, chlorhexidine allergies and the incident rate going up. And there's a lot of uses of it happening in medical, and they're making an assumption that maybe because it's being used more prevalently, this is creating some sort of allergy in the public. Um, but that uh, being said, it's still a good rent. I, I would never write it off. It's kind of like writing off that bisphosphonates are bad drugs just because they have the potential to cause bronze. We know the overwhelming research on bisphosphonates is how much they help bones and osteoporotic women. So you can't say it's a bad drug, it's a great drug. It's just that there's sometimes certain issues with it. And that's my feelings about chlorhexidine. Well, it doesn't seem that there's any more. I've gone two minutes over. I appreciate everybody for staying on and hanging on. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and wherever you're at in time or in life, I wish you all the best and great success. Remember, the best is yet to come. Thank you.